Heroes in Prevention is a organization-wide effort to break the chains of infection, to go beyond hand-washing programs and flu shots, to create a whole new approach to minimizing infections. That what I'm going to give you today is really part of a four or five hour leadership workshop, which I had applied for for the intensives. And they gave me an hour and a half. So I, number one, I'm going to talk fast. Number two, we're not going to do as many exercises as I normally would. And number three, there's certain things I'm not going to get to. I've given you a handout which has more than I know I will get to. Because it, you have it. Yeah, I don't know where she got it. But <laughs> okay, it's on email. Okay, so I'm going to get started right away. My name is Mary Tellis Nyack, and if you would like the actual PowerPoint to this presentation, if you email me, and please specify leadership because I've done two presentations today. So if you specify leadership, I will send it to you. Mary at myinterview.com. I have been attending um, Pioneer Network meetings since they started in Rochester in 1997. And I was a very big advocate of person-centered care in all of the jobs that I have had since then. So today we're going to look at some leadership practices. If we have time, I'm hoping we're going to look at your leadership style. We're going to look at the difference between an engaged employee, a motivated employee, a satisfied employee, and what, what causes commitment. And then I'm going to talk a little, well, quite a bit about hiring, because it's all about hiring as far as I'm concerned. Leadership is absolutely essential if you're going to transform your culture to one of being person-centered from being a compliant culture. And those of us that have worked in nursing homes know that regulation has lobotomized administrators. That was a quote from Monsignor Fahey back in the late 80s. And it is as true then as it is now. I have worked with Lisa Deaton, who at one time was the survey director in the state of Louisiana. And she and I and Jeff, Gareb, Jeff Jerebker and Linda, Linda Wendt Crandall went around the state of, George, of Louisiana. And Lisa would stand on the stage and she'd say, tell me which regulation is, being, is in your way of doing culture change. And then she would talk about it. And she'd say, we can fix that, or this is how you get around that, or this is what you do to meet that. It was an amazing thing, and she was an amazing state survey director leader who was really wedded toward culture. If we look at the administrator and the director of nursing, we know two things. They are by far the best predictors of a quality collapse or a quality success. Some of you were at the presentation my husband and I did this morning. He has done a lot of research in long-term care, and one of the things he looked at was what is the impact of turnover on quality? So what he did was he looked at nursing homes and divided them into three cate six categories. One in which the nursing home administrator did not turn over in two years, one in which there was one turnover in two years, and the other category is when there was two or more turnover in two years. Same with directors of nursing. And then he looked at what happens in these nursing homes to this census, or, I'm sorry, to these indicators when there's this kind of turnover. So what did he find? We'll just go through a couple of them. This is what happens to families who say they are very satisfied when the DON turns over. This is what happens to families that say they are very satisfied when the nursing home administrator turnover. So if there's no turnover, this is the satisfaction level of the families. With two, year, two, turns, two turnovers in two years, it drops hugely. This is what happens to staff satisfaction. The same kind of project, uh, projectile, as it were, what is what happens when the DON and or the administrator turns over. What happens to CNA turnover? What happens to registry use? And in fact, we could go through every indicator for which there is data in a nursing home, and we would see the same 
kind of picture. One thing I can tell you just off the cuff is when there is turnover, the number of citations you get goes up. The G and above citations go up. The deficiency freeze go down. So there, even accounts receivable is impacted by DON and administrator turnover. So what then is leadership? I would like you now to think of someone in your life who has been an effective leader. Picture them. And I'd like you now to share for about three minutes the qualities that that person had that make them, in your mind, an outstanding leader. Share them with your table, please. Okay, Claire, Char, Char. Char, Char, what were some of the things you said at this table? Integrity. Integrity. How many said something about integrity or honesty or something of that nature? Okay, another. Um, innovative. Innovative. How about innovative? Anybody have that? Okay, what else? Willing to learn and Willing change their mind. Willing to learn or change their mind. What else did you say, you guys? Transparent. Transparent. Anything else from the, your table? Uh, honest. Honest. Good listener. listener. A good okay. listener. What about your table? What are some of the things? Um, we said good work ethic was always at work. And um, also, they weren't afraid to just jump in and help out. OK. How many had something like that, always willing to jump in and help out? That, I think, is a real characteristic of a, a real leader, a person who never asks you to do something they wouldn't do themselves, right? Anything else that you want to just call mirror? OK, what about you? What, what were some of the things you brought up? A led by example, um, very fair. Fair, OK. And uh, supportive and encouraging when you needed direction or needed a little bit of help. OK. Anyone else? Someone, someone else, sir, what did you think? Anything different? Patient and focused. Patient and focused, OK. Now, are there anything, any things that have not been mentioned that you have? Yes, back there. Pardon? Communication, a good communicator. I bet a lot of you had that, because that's a huge issue with leadership, and the fact is that they are or they, not, they are not a good leader. So, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you had very similar things, but there's also a very long list of them. If we were to take every one of your things, it would be a very long list, which is why you're so tired at night. <laughs> now, what is the difference between being a leader and being a boss? 
Just because you have a position as a manager or a supervisor or a lead person, and that gives you the authority to accomplish certain tasks, it doesn't make you a leader. Power and authority does not make you a leader. It makes you a boss. So let's look at some of the differences between a boss and a leader. A boss drives employees. A leader coaches them. A boss depends on their authority. A leader depends on the goodwill. A leader inspires, I'm sorry, a boss inspires fear. A leader generates enthusiasm. A boss says, I. That sounds like a reason political talk I just heard. A boss says, hi. A leader says, we. A boss places blame for the breakdown. A leader fixes the breakdown. And this is something else that a lot of people have said in sessions like this, that a leader uses a mistake I made to help me grow. They don't reprimand me. They use it as a teachable moment. They also said, many people have said, a leader has seen in me things which I have not seen in myself and brought them out. When I worked for a very large nursing home chain at one point in my life, and ran into an administrator in Florida who had been a maintenance man at a nursing home. And the administrator had seen in him something that she felt could be developed. She worked with him, he got his nursing home administrator license in Florida, and then he was running his own nursing home. And it was, it was an amazing thing, and it was all because someone saw in him something that he didn't see in himself. A, a boss knows how it's done. A leader shows how it's done. A boss uses people. A leader develops people. A boss takes the credit. A leader gives the credit. A boss commands. A leader asks. A boss says, go. A leader says, let's go. So I think there's a lot of things there to think about in one's leadership style. So basically it boils down to a boss is someone who tells people to accomplish a, a task or an objective, whereas a leader makes people want to achieve that goal or that objective. So how then does one strive to be an effective leader? There are three theories of leadership we're going to talk about. The first one is called the trait theory. And that theory says that people are born leaders. It's part of their DNA. It's, it's within them when they're born. And there are certain people in this world who that may have been the case. Maybe Martin Luther King, maybe Gandhi, maybe George Washington. I don't know. We don't know. But the reality is that there are very few people who have the natural talent for leading others from birth. And you know, if you were asked people, what are the traits of a leader? A lot of people would say they're very much extroverts, when in fact, in Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, he says that the leaders who have brought companies to being good, to being great, were actually very reserved people. They were not filled with themselves. They were not boisterous and narcissistic. They were humble people who brought a company from good to great. They not necessarily were extroverts. Then there is the great events theory. That means something happened in life to make you feel, oh, I think I could do this, or whatever. You know, um, a part of that for me, frankly, has been my husband. When I married my husband, I was a, a school teacher. And he, there was something that happened in our life that it did not appear we were going to have children. And he said, why don't you go into health care? Because many of you know in this room, I was a religious sister. And the order I entered did not have medical, a medical mission. So I ended up being a teacher out of holy obedience. And so he said, you always wanted to be a doctor. Why don't you look into health care? And that is how I became a nurse. And then he kept pushing me. He kept pushing me and showing me things that I could do. 
If it were not for him, I swear to you, I'd still be teaching music on the south side of Chicago. Because someone saw in me something that I didn't know I had, and he, to me, was my great event. What about transformational leadership? That is the third aspect of leadership, transformational leadership. And that says that people can want to be a leader, can grow to be a leader, can learn to be a leader. And this theory is the most widely accepted theory in leadership. Anyone can learn and grow to be a leader. So good leaders are made, they are not born. That is what the research shows. So how do you become a leader? You become a better leader through self-study, through education, through training, from experience, and also I would like to add through mentoring. Find people in your organization or within this amazing network of people who you believe are true leaders and ask them to help you. If you, in fact, are part of a corporation, you have other administrators, other directors of nursing, other directors of resident life who you may admire. Ask them to come and observe you doing something and give you feedback. That is the way you will learn. It is, unfortunately, the negative in feedback we get that helps us to grow. If everyone tells us we're great, we're not going to be greater that way. We need people to critically assess how we could grow. So we need, are going to focus now on three things. The first one is what you are. Above all, you and we in this room are all professionals. In the company where I worked for several years, we had 24,000 CNAs. And my, I developed a nurse aid leadership council. They were my advisors. And what I found out was when I met them, they would say, I am just a CNA. I said, we are abolishing the word just from your language. You are not just anything. Then when I went to the American College of Healthcare Administrators, I heard administrators saying, I'm just the administrator of a nursing home. Excuse me? Excuse me? You are running a million dollar business. You are in charge of lives which are the most frail in our society. You are not just anything. So we have to stand tall and know that no matter what anyone says, we are professionals. And why do I say that? Because I came from an environment where I wanted to set up an opportunity for nursing students to come to our, our nursing home. At that time, Ana Ortegara was the assistant director of nursing and I was the director of nursing. We had two master prepared nurses in a huge nursing home connected with University of Illinois. When I went to the head of med surge nursing, do you know what this dear woman said to me? I can see her today, Marjorie Powers. God rest her soul, I'm sure she's no longer with us. But she said to me, Mary, no one with a good grade point average goes into nursing home care. No one with a good grade point average goes into nursing home care. The jocks of nursing go into uh, trauma and ICU. I said, excuse me, Marjorie. Both my AGON and I have 4.0 averages in, in graduate school. Don't tell me smart women, men, do not go into long-term care. Do not tell me that. The problem is not long-term care. The problem is you. <laughs> I said, you send me 12 student nurses, and I will send you 11 of them back who, at a minimum, have an appreciation of what we do. Even Jesus did not have 100% success with his apostles. <laughs> so I'm not saying I can send you back 12, but I will send you back 11. And ultimately, we got some psych nursing students to come over because we had a psych floor, and they loved it, said it was the best experience of their life. So from that moment on, 1983, I have known that the hospital nurses think we, nurses in long-term care, work there because we couldn't make it in a hospital. Baloney. That is malarkey. What do you know? 
you know, number one, that different people require different leadership styles. You have some staff who will come to you and say, is this right? Am I doing this correct? And two hours later, now I've done this part, is this okay? They are called high maintenance staff. And they make you crazy if you're not that way. Then there are other people who come and you give them the job and you don't see them till it's over. And for some of you that's fine if you don't like to micromanage. So we have all these people who we are wanting to follow us and we have to lead each of them in, in kind of their own way. We, we do. To be successful, you need to convince your followers, not yourself or your boss, that you're worthy to be led. Okay? The other thing is communication. Communication is huge. We all know that we communicate more with our body language than we do with our voices and our words. Tone of voice, of course, is huge, but with the words. Communication is a huge thing. And knowing that you should never ask them to perform anything you would not perform. The other thing is in situations that are different. If you are in the process of going through a culture change situation, you are going to lead in a different way now than you will two years from now. If you are going through a merger with another company, you are going to lead in a different way. If you had a bad survey outcome, you're going to lead in a different way. If you have a union home, you're going to lead in a different way. So this, again, is why you are so tired. Leadership is not easy. So what do you know? Do you know your job? A leader must know their job. They must have a solid familiarity with everyone's job, which is why they have AIT programs. Unfortunately, they do not have donut programs, D-O-N in training. D-O-Ns, this is what happens. Joe Lee is the MDS coordinator. My, my director of nursing resigns. I walk over to, G-O-N, to Jolie, I tap her on the shoulder, and I say, you're it. That is how people become D-O-Ns. You're it. So there is very little training where there should be training. OK, now, what else do you know? Do you know human nature? Do you know the importance of sincerely caring for your workers. Our data at my interview shows the most important question on the survey, if an employee is going to recommend you to someone else, is does management care about me? The most important question. The second most important question is, does management listen to me? Those are the key issues for management. Caring about and listening to employees. That is what you must know about human nature. The next thing is, do you know yourself? Now, unfortunately, there are no notepads here. But I'm hoping all of you have some sort of a piece of paper, whether even if it's the program and you just write on top of it. This is what I want you to do. I want you, in the next two minutes, to draw a pig. That is all I'm telling you. Grab something. I don't care what you grab. Just grab something and draw a pig, even if it's on top of the program for today. Just draw the pig. I thought for sure they would have notepads at the tables, but they don't. We'll have to tell them about that.
right now, the way you drew that pig is going to tell you something about your own personality. Is your pig at the top of the page? If so, you are positive, optimistic, and have a sunny outlook. I know it, I know, I know. <laughs> if you drew your pig at the bottom of the page, you may be a skeptic and somewhat cynical with a tendency to see the glass as half empty. If you drew the pig in the middle of the page, you are a realist and very pragmatic. Okay, that's me. Yeah. That's you, okay. Does the, um, does the pig face left, right, or center? If the pig faces left, you believe in tradition, you are friendly, and you remember birthdays. <laughs> if the pig faces right, you are innovative, creative, and active, but may not have a strong sense of family, preferring autonomy. You have a tendency to forget dates. If your pig faces front, you are direct, you enjoy playing the devil's advocate, you're not afraid of confronting a bad situation. You neither fear nor avoid hard questions. Now, does your pig have many details? If it does, you are analytical, cautious, but somewhat distrustful or wary of others. If you have few details, you are emotional and naive. <laughs> you tend to see the big picture but you're impatient with details, you are a risk taker. Now, how many legs does your pig have showing? If it has fewer than four, you may be living through a period of change or self-reflection. But if all four are showing, you have a healthy self-image. You may be stubborn, but you stick to your principles. Now, the question is, how big are your pig's ears? The size of the ears indicates how good a listener you are. The bigger, the better. Now, if you didn't draw a pig at all, you're just no fun. And you will live a long and miserable life and die a horrible, smelly death. So, so the question is, Hopefully now, the point here was to try to think about who you are as a person, who you are, and, and that hopefully got you thinking about who you are. The, second, the last thing we want to talk about is what do you do? You provide direction on how to achieve goals. You get their, their buy-in, you give them a vision, you make timely decisions, you may not be uh, impetuous, but in the, if if a case is needed, you will make a decision and stick to it. You know how to communicate with your team. So what do you do to create a culture change? An aim for future culture change must include, number one, a vision. Where is the organization wanting to go together? Number two, a mission what you will do together, what you will do together. And the third thing is guiding behavioral principles. How do you expect your associates to behave? What is the expectation of how they are going to behave? Let me give an example. Before coming to this hotel, I called ahead to ask for a wheelchair for my husband. Many hotels have wheelchairs they will allow you to use. However, Hyatt has an interesting policy. They require that the security guard always push the wheelchair. Now, I ran into this in Dallas, too. And of course, I wrote a lengthy email to the Hyatt Corporation saying, are you aware of the trends in demography? Are you honestly going to hire enough security guards that it will be able to push all your wheelchair-bound residents? I said, do you know that I probably have more experience pushing a wheelchair than your security guard? So what is the problem? If you want me to sign something, I will. 
If you want me to leave you my credit card for fear I'll steal it, I will. So I wrote to the, his name is Frank. I wrote to Frank here and told him all this. And he could tell I was upset. So he wrote back to me, and he said, we will take care of it. And he implied, I, I read it wrong, he implied that they would get the concierge to get me to hire a wheelchair, which was going to cost $150. So I wrote back and I said, I really don't know why I have to pay this. Anyway, Frank called me. Frank called me on the phone. And we had a nice chat. I explained to him, I teach customer satisfaction. I, in fact, sent him one of my presentations, which he is now using in the hotel. And he said, I will surely see you. Last night, I ran into Frank. And I will tell you one thing. I told Frank, your message is being heard. You have some of the most helpful staff I have ever run into in a hotel. Everyone is friendly. Everyone is willing to help you. I said, whatever you're doing, you're doing it right, and you certainly have my, made my stay better. So there have to be these guiding principles, and he obviously has set them out, and he's now using my PowerPoint in his training program. <laughs> so this is what a leader does. What else do you do? You motivate. You know your team, and you look out for their well-being, and you are a good role model. So what are the indicators of motivation? The indicators of motivation are engagement, satisfaction, commitment, and unwillingness to quit. So what is motivation? Motivation is what makes a person behave in a particular way. It makes you behave in a particular way. So in April and May, women are what? Losing weight so they look better in their bathing suits. It is a motivating factor. If your blood sugar is 200, you are motivated to eat a better diet. If your cholesterol is 300, you are motivated. These are all things that motivate us. It is that underlying energy that compels action in a particular direction. However, if a pretty picture on the wall and a cute saying is all that it takes to motivate you, you probably have an easy job the kind that robots will soon be doing. <laughs> now, there's nothing wrong with accessories, nothing wrong with them, but they are not enough to motivate. So what is employee satisfaction? Well, when an employee is satisfied, it tells you what they feel about their job. They may feel an effective job satisfaction, which means they have an emotional satisfaction with their job. It's pleasurable. They like to get in the car in the morning and go to work. They don't say when they get in the car, oh, do I have to go to that place again today? That is not satisf satisfaction. The cognitive, there's also the possibility of cognitive job satisfaction. They're satisfied with the location. It's near my home. They're very flexible here. I can have flexible hours, and I have children. They, are, uh, they have a good benefit program. They allow me to go back to school. Those are all what would be cognitive satisfaction. Now, you cannot read this very well, but what I want to show you is this is the difference in productivity between happy people and unhappy people. So the point is, I'll just go through a couple of these. Do something that is good for your company, even if it is not expected of you. Happy, unhappy. Make recommendations about improvement that can be made in your company. Happy, unhappy. Look for a job within the next six months. Happy, unhappy. So the key here is to hire happy people. Do not hire moody people. No, they're not. They're not. These are the unhappy people. They're not, yeah. Now then, what is employee engagement? We hear a lot, are, are employees engaged? What, what does that mean? What does it mean? What is, when do you think uh, an employee is engaged, Jolie? What, what would they be doing to show they're engaged? They'll be working with the goals, meet, to meet the goals you have set. What are some other things that might be an engaged employee? 
going the second mile, okay? Going out of the way. What else? Engage. Pardon? Initiative to try new things. They're willing to try new things. It is about their relationship between the organization and the employee. An engaged employee is one who is fully absorbed by, enthusiastic about their work. They take positive actions to further the organization's reputation. And what has been shown is that an organization with high employee engagement will be expected to outperform those with low employee engagement if all things are equal. A recent study from Gallup found that few organizations know how to truly engage their employees. 13% of employees worldwide are engaged. 13, one, three. The remaining 87% are either not engaged or indifferent, or even worse, actively disengaged and potentially hostile toward their organization. So this was another thing that I found, which talks about what makes an employee engaged. Now these two men, the man on the left is engaged. The man on the right is not engaged. Now whether it's because his pants are too tight or what, I'm not really sure, but he's not engaged, but this guy is. So we're going to say, what are some of these factors that cause engagement? Number one, someone has talked to me about my progress. 92% of engaged people say that has happened. 13% of non-engaged people say that has happened. Someone encourages my development. 97% of engaged people say, yes, that's happened. Only 10% of non-engaged. They have been praised recently. They have opportunities to learn and grow. They have a best friend at work. 74% of engaged employees say they have a best friend at work, whereas only 19% of non-engaged. Their manager cares about them. Remember what I was saying on our questionnaire. Management cares about me. Look, 98% of engaged employees say their management cares about them, and only 20% um, of non-engaged. They view their job as important to the company. That is so important that every employee can connect the dots between what they do and the good of the resident. That is really, really important. My opinion counts. My colleagues are committed to doing a good job. They are able to do their best every day. They have equipment they need to do the job. They know what is expected of them at work. So you can see it's pretty startling, the difference between the engaged and engaged. So how do you know if people are engaged? Well, you can do an annual survey. That's fine, and that's good. You can do um, a regular one-on-one -on -one meeting between managers and their team members. You can hold monthly team meetings. You can do team huddles. And you can do team outings. All of these things would be likely to increase engagement. But you can ask them questions to find out if they're engaged. Number one, do you enjoy what you're doing? Are you challenged in what you do? Are you too challenged? What can I do to help you achieve your goals? And helping them to set goals is another important aspect of getting them to be engaged. So how do you spot an engaged employee? How do you find them? Why do you want to find them? You want to find them because when you need a new employee, this is the person you're going to to ask if they have a friend. So you want to be able to spot your engaged employees. Here's how, they, how they can, uh, you can spot them. They contribute in a meeting. They contribute in inter-office communication. They make suggestions of how to improve something. They share things about the company on social media, not pictures, however. They tell others about their job and how happy they are there. 
and they bring suggestions of new employees to HR. And this is the group you want to get the suggestions from. You do not want to get the suggestions from the low performers and the non-engaged employees. So some people are motivated by money. Others are motivated by recognition. Others just want to know that they're, they're, they're doing a good job. They want to contribute. So you have to ask yourself, what motivates you? What motivates you? What, why do you get up every morning and do this work? There are two types of motivation, extrinsic and intrinsic. Extrinsic motivation is money and benefits. There are no longer, these are no longer enough to compel workers to act, and let me show you why. If you're in my last session, you remember, this is how we array our questions. This is something my husband developed. The better the score on the question, the higher the question, the farther to the right is the question, the more that question influences the person to recommend you to someone else as a place to work. Okay? So, this, is, this question up here is, I get job satisfaction. My job allows me to know I'm doing a difference. Best score. For, for 15 years, it's the best score. These three over here are the most highly correlated to whether or not you're going to recommend, but they also have some of the worst scores. And they are, management cares about me, management listens to me, and I get help with job stress. What I'm showing you this slide for really is number five. Number five is pay. Are they happy with their pay? No. Is it an influencer? Not at all. 250,000 employees' feedback is in this chart. Quarter of a million. And this is pay. You can see there's only three things that are less influential than pay if they're going to recommend you as a place for work. So in our worlds of long-term care, pay is not a motivator except for therapists. No lie. If you look, and I have done, we've done surveys with therapy companies, pay is way over here. But these are people who are not therapists who work in long-term care. Business office, maintenance, laundry, activities, social work, nurse aides, nurses, etc. cetera. That is, so that's an important thing for you to remember. What are intrinsic motivators? They are religion, they are altruism, and they are experience. When I worked with my, the 24,000, well, I worked with about 28 of them on my advisory council, I cannot begin to tell you how many times I heard the answers to this question, why do you do this work? So many times the answers were, it is my calling from God. I am doing this to make a difference. It is my vocation. From CNAs, that is what they told me. That is what they told me. So many of them were motivated by religion. Many of them were motivated by altruism. And many of them were motivated simply by their life experiences. We found out when we, I had focus groups with over 200 CNAs, and we found out that 95% of them had a caregiver in their family. Oh, my gram took in people from the neighborhood. My mother took in our aunts and uncles, my aunts when we were growing up. Someone in their family was a caregiver. They had the experience of caregiving in their upbringing. So your job as a leader is to find out what motivates your employees. What is it? What keeps them coming back? What keeps them loving? What keeps them compassionate? What is the driver? That gentleman I told you that was a maintenance person who became an administrator, his nurse aides told me that every day at 10 o'clock he has a prayer service. This is not a nonprofit home. This is not a religious. This, is a public, this was a publicly traded nursing home. But this man knew what motivated his employees. 
and he developed it. He developed it. When an employee is intrinsically motivated, you don't need to be there because you're not the boss. They are doing it from inside. You do not need to be there when they are intrinsically motivated. Economic rewards work pretty well if you want compliance, but if you really want commitment, you need more than that. External motivators such as money and benefits are no longer enough to compel workers to act. You are a leader, and your job is to create other leaders. So how do you encourage leadership? How do you do this in a culture where you are trying to change the culture to a culture of compassion, of person-centered care, of choice and preference? How do you do that? Number one, encourage, in the moment, feedback. Instant, on-the-spot feedback is one way your team can communicate well with one another and with you. You want your team to trust you and each other to deliver honest and helpful praise. The second thing, cultivate executive mentality. Staff wonder what you're doing in your office. Tell them. Tell them. With our nurse aides, we explained to them about Medicaid. They didn't know. They didn't know anything about Medicaid. They didn't realize that we don't get enough Medicaid money to pay for the care. They didn't get that. But now they, they eventually knew because we taught them. Transparency is very, very important in a relationship between uh, the leaders of a, home, uh, of a nursing home or assisted living and the, the staff. Host regular meetings. Share with them the happenings in your organization. There were some nursing homes that I went into that the staff didn't even know who was the owner. They had no idea who owned the nursing home. Nothing. Every one of you has a culture in your nursing home. If you're a VA home or you're a state VA home, you have a culture that you can share. If you are a Presbyterian home, there is a culture there to share. If you are a Catholic home, you have a huge culture to share. If you're a Jewish home, share that culture. Let them know. Present new challenges and opportunities. Invite people to be part of the team. One of the things that I've always criticized ever since I was a DON is that it's so difficult to get nurse aides to care plan conferences. So difficult because we don't have time. Yes, you do have time. You can figure out a way to do it. For example, have them come for the first five minutes. They don't have to stay for the whole half hour or whatever. Have them come for the first five minutes and give their input. Let them know that their voice is important. I was suggesting this morning, one of the nurse aides said to me, you know, Mary, I can help out with orientation. That staff developer has only been here two weeks. I've been here 10 years. I know how this place works. Why can't I do part of orientation? There are so many things that we can engage our employees to do and will help them to grow as leaders. Respect their boundaries. It's important to give them things to do, but don't give them things that they can't do. Help them to make, be successful. You can't give them a job and then criticize them for not doing it if they don't have the tools, either mental or physical, to do it. So you have to be careful. Give them flexibility. You're used to driving the car with your hands on the wheel like this. Let them have some opportunity. Let them drive for a while. Sit down with your team and explain how much flexibility they will have within a task you give them. Don't babysit. Micromanagement is the worst thing for creativity and leadership development, is micromanagement. I have known many nurses who have left jobs because they were being micromanaged. Micromanagement is the killer of initiative, the killer of initiative, so don't babysit. So how does a leader then promote a team? Well, number one, you have to have an environment where people trust each other. That has to be there. You have to set up systems and structures. You just can't say, be a team. If you have a morning huddle or a morning stand-up, that is a structure by which you are developing a team. That is a structure. 
Encourage team communication so that the team will get an identity. The use of we rather than I. Foster the evolution of natural leadership. All of you know the CNAs, the personal care assistants in your communities who have leadership capabilities. Let them do it in a positive manner, not a negative manner. Establish team goals rather than individual goals. We all know if we have individual goals, we may step over people to get to that goal. Whereas if it's a team goal, we are working together to reach that goal. And of course, celebrate your achievements, even those that are minor. Listen to anything with anyone with an original idea, no matter how it may sound at first. If you put fences around people, you get sheep. Give them the room they need to grow. If you have not read this book, it's an old book. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's from the, it's from the uh, 1900s, for sure. But it's a, still a very good book, First Break All the Rules by Buckingham and Kaufman. And it is a Gallup study of over a million employees to find out what they thought about their managers. These are a couple things from it. Number one, talented employees may join you because of your charisma, but they will stay because of their relationship with the immediate supervisor. So they may be attracted to you because of your mission, because of your charismatic leadership, but they will stay because of the charge nurse. So if your mission, if your vision doesn't penetrate to that charge nurse, don't expect the CNA to get it. They won't. They won't. It has to be their immediate supervisor. Employees leave managers, not organizations. Okay? They leave managers, not organizations. These are the six core things that that book talks about that employees say are important to them. Number one, I know what is expected of me. Example, my mother was dying in a Catholic charity nursing home in Chicago. I came up from where I was living to be with her. I walked in one day, and there she was sitting at 10 o'clock in the morning in her polyester dress. And I said to the nurse aide, Mom is dying. Why did you put a dress on her? Oh, well, the administrator would yell at me if I didn't have everyone up and dressed by 10 o'clock. And I said to her, if you were dying, would you rather be in a dress or your nightie? She said, my nightie. I said, well, then let's put a nightie on her. She didn't know what is expected of her. She was, of course, she might have been yelled at. Who knows? But the point is, the expectation is that the, the resident is comfortable, that the resident is in the right situation. And being in a polyester dress the week before you die is not what most of us would want. We would want to be comfortable. So let's think about what is really wanted of me as a CNA. Do I have the materials and information I need to do my job right? Even in graduate school in gerontological nursing, of course, this is years ago, Juliet, do not blame my teachers for this, but we knew all the organic issues of Alzheimer's disease. I could tell you about all the organic stuff, but I had not a clue of how to take care of a person with dementia. Not a clue. So when a person comes into your community and you're going to put them on your Alzheimer's unit or working with people with dementia, you must ensure that they have the proper training. It's not only the, the stuff that they need, it's the training they need on how to be successful. If they're going to be working with short-stay patients in ortho, re ortho rehab, that's another skill set. They need to be taught what to do. And they will not be successful unless you make sure they have the proper information. Do I have the opportunity to do what I do best? I was a music teacher at one point in my life, and I loved to sing and play the piano. My first job at Rush University where I met Anna Orchigara, by the way, was we had, our, we had a big pod. And all the rooms emptied out in the pod, and there was a piano in the pod. So if I was finished with my work, we did primary nursing in those days, we, I would play the piano and sing. And one day, this little lady came up to me and said, 
are you Mary Poppins? How sweet. But I was able to do what I do best. That was something, part, un, unlike my professional life as a nurse, I could do something else. And every one of your staff can do something else besides be whatever they are at your home. Why don't you have them do activities with your residents? What about the maintenance man who's got a great um, uh, workshop at home and he does a lot of work, woodwork? Why, don't he, why doesn't he bring that in and take the men and do a woodworking project? What about your, choir, your um, head of housekeeping who's a choir member at the church? Have her come and lead a, a session of spirituals. What about the lady in the laundry who decorates the best cookies ever? Have her come and do an activity where the residents are able to decorate cookies under her activity. You see, you win on both sides. The, cl the client is able to have a variety of activities, and the, your, your staff person is able to do what they do best. Have I received recognition in the last seven days? Think about that. Human beings need to be recognized. And according to the Gallup study, it's once a week. So think about the people that report to you. Do you give them a attaboy once a week, pat on the back, word of encouragement? That's what they need, once a week. Does my superior care about me as a person? Does my boss care that my mother was just diagnosed with dementia? Does my boss know that my son was just in an automobile accident? Does my son, does my boss know that these eyes, which we claim came from falling down the chair, stairs, were really my husband beating me? Does someone care about me as a person? And does someone encourage my development? At the nursing home where I was the director of nursing, we had a GED program because a lot of our nurses' aides did not have their high school diplomas. So we offered them the opportunity to stay after work, and our nurse aide trainer conducted a GED program for them, and many of them got their GED. Does someone care about my personal development? So many of these things that we just mentioned are really on the difference between our engaged and our disengaged gentlemen. So what does a great leader look for? Do they look for competence or do they look for talent? Competence, skills, and talent. What is the difference? We talk a lot about competence, and all of you have a competency checklist, I'm sure, that when someone comes in, you check them off and see, are they competent in all these areas? We hardly ever talk about talent, though. Leaders are concerned about talent. Managers are concerned about competence. You have to be both, because you can't hire incompetent people, but you also want people with talent. At Disneyland, they ask two questions. Is the person happy? Second question, is the person smart? I didn't say educated, I said smart. If you're smart, I can teach you anything. If you're happy, you're gonna make my customers happy. Even at a very prestigious restaurant at Epcot Center, experience and skill were secondary to talent. So how do we nurture talent? The cradle of talent for all of you is the relationship between the nurse and the resident, the nurse aide and the resident, the caregiver, the personal caregiver, and the resident. For a leader, this is your ground zero. How do you, do you nurture that relationship? But the question is, what talents are you looking for? So let's look for a second at the top drivers of resident satisfaction. In independent living, in assisted living, in nursing homes, and in short stay. Please notice how care and concern is in the top five of all areas, and these numbers are correlation coefficients. The higher the number, the higher the influence, the highest you can get is one, which you will never see. Anything above five is strongly correlated. So every one of these is above five. They're, I mean, these are at six. 
So our short stay residents say the most important thing to them is that the staff show care and concern, that they're competent. Our nursing home residents say that staff show care and concern and they're competent. Assisted living has a little different, and assisted living has always been a little different than the rest, but care and concern is still in the top five. Families, what do they want? Guess what? Care and concern of staff. So if, in fact, families and residents across the post-acute continuum want the staff to be caring and concerned, that means the staff have to be compassionate, right? That has, that's what that means. They have to be compassionate. A wonderful, sweet, elderly resident passed away at the nursing home I worked at. A woman who never complained, always had a smile, and said thank you to all of us aides for helping her out. She spoke with a very soft voice. She had no visitors ever, which breaks my heart. The other three caring aides I worked with tonight all sat on her bed, holding her hand, praying, and letting her know she wasn't alone. At 9.45, this wonderful sweet lady is now at peace. Every one of you wants her. Every one of your residents wants her. So how do we find her? The resident, the world of the nursing home or the assisted living is where two worlds meet. The world of the resident and the world of the CNA. The resident has the lowest status age, uh, lowest status, is the lowest status age group. And if you don't believe that, <laughs> go out with my husband for a few hours. And you will see in a few hours how ageism is so prevalent in our society. Because his speech is not clear from Parkinson's, there are many people who do not have the patience to listen to him. And what will happen is they will a he will ask a question and they will answer me. I see it every day of my life. This is a, com a country of ageism. There's no question. Not this meeting. Not this meeting. He's feeling very comfortable here. A, elderly feel a loss of health. They've lost their role in society. He will tell you in his articles, he's written in several articles on what it feels like to have Parkinson's, and he uses the words, I, I feel minimized and marginalized. Minimized and marginalized. And I will tell you a lot of that comes from his unwillingness to wear the hearing aid I bought him. <laughs> and I do remind him of that. But then he hates having a nurse for a wife. He also, I mean, also among the elderly, they are dependent and they are frail and they are powerless to change because they have to depend on us. They have to depend on us. He has to depend on me to get him from place to place. He can no longer drive. He can no longer walk from place to place. He has to depend on me. He is powerless without me, to be perfectly honest. Now let's look at the nurse aides. They are the weakest social class. They are saying, I am just a CNA. One nurse aide told me she takes off her name tag when she goes into the grocery store in her village because she doesn't want people to know she works in a nursing home. Because people say to her, how can you do that work? It's so dirty. Why can't, how can you do that work? She said, I love my job, but I don't want to have to answer to people. They are the least paid, the least autonomous, and they too are powerless to change. So we have the meeting of this world with this world, and this is where quality takes place. And this is where your job as the DON, the administrator, to generate a quality of life for both of these groups. Because unless the nurse aides have a quality of life, the residents will not have a quality of life. And my husband has evidence to show that in data. Unless the residents have a quality workplace, the, st the um, I'm sorry, unless the CNAs have a quality workplace, the elders will not have a quality of life. So the cradle of quality is this interaction. For the residents, their world is the CNA, and for the CNA, their world is the nursing home. So much of the nursing home is their world. 
So a manager's most important job is to do what? Get the right people in the right place doing the right things for the right reasons. Recruiting and keeping the best talent is arguably the single most important thing that a manager does. In Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, he says, the executives who ignite the transformation from being good to being great did not first figure out where to drive the bus and then get people to get on it. They first got the right people on the bus and the wrong people off the bus. I'm going to say that again. They got the wrong people off the bus. Nurse aides do not like working with the wrong people. They don't like it. They would rather work short than work with the wrong people. So you as a leader, as you're going through culture change, you're going to have to get rid of some people. They're not going to make it. It's not within them. They are dyed-in-the-wool, traditional hospital, medical model people. They need to get another job. And you need to help them. You need to dehire them. <laughs> Determine who are the right people. How do we do that? Number one, exercise, I mean, <laughs> not exercise, emphasize their character more than the specific experience or education they have. Exceptional leaders know that skills and knowledge are teachable, whereas character traits are ingrained. And if you attended the session this morning, what we talked about is that compassion is in all of us. It is in, in us. Because why? It is in primates. There are many examples we could give, and if you get our book, you will see them, of bonobo uh, monkeys showing compassion. So it's there. It's there, and we share 98% of the genes with monkeys. So it is there. The question is, number one, how was it nurtured? And number two, what choices did people make along the way? But it is there. And this is a book that I always recommend to everyone, written by Barbara Frank, Kathy Bra Brady, and David Farrell, who spoke yesterday. In that book, they talk about how to, how to hire. You're not looking just for a large pool of candidates. You're looking for the right pool of candidates. So what are your selling points? Why would someone want to come and work in your community? What about referring a friend? This is where you go to your top workers, your top workers, and say, I have an opening. Do you have any friends? That is what you do. And then you give them a bonus if that person comes to work. And you give them the bonus when they start. It is your job to keep them. What are good sources of candidates? David Farrell says, and maybe he said this yesterday, he never goes out without his business cards. I hate to admit it, but Vivian and I do occasionally like a little Kentucky Fried Chicken. I know my son says, it's not chicken, Mom. Whatever it is, that's why they call it KFC. They don't call it Kentucky Fried Chicken, he tells me, because they're not chickens. Now, what they are, God alone knows. They look like chickens to me. At any rate, I was going through the, a line the other night at, in the car at Kentucky Fried Chicken. And of course, I always feel guilty every time I do it. But at any rate, the woman behind the microphone sounded so nice. Her voice just, it was customer service, it was warm, it was lovely, just lovely. If David Farrell had been there, and I was very close to saying it, have you ever, have you ever thought of a career, a career in healthcare? Find the woman at McDonald's, find the woman at Burger King, find the woman at Target. Give them your card. You can train them to be a CNA. You can't train them as easily to be compassionate. So don't limit the places you look for people. Take time to hire someone who will be value added to the team. And this process must be multi-layered. Number one, you do your thing. You do your thing. You do your urine test, your, your TB test, your competency test. You do it all. Fine, wonderful, but what next? What next? That new hire must meet the staff he or she is going to be working with. They need a chance to have input. 
The nurse aides told me, you just give me a candidate for five minutes and I'll tell you whether they're going to make it or not. Five minutes, they said. We'll tell you whether they're going to make it or not. What is the third layer? The residents. Every resident wants a voice in who's going to care for them. Everyone does. When I'm gone just one night, I have a caregiver for Vivian, and he does his own Craigslist. He puts his ad on Craigslist, he takes the phone calls, he interviews them on the phone, and then occasionally he'll bring them to the house if they're one of the finalists. And then once in a while, he'll allow me to meet them. He wants a voice in who is caring for him. Why are our residents any different? They're caring for their most intimate bodily functions. So there was a nursing home in Bethel, Connecticut, where they did this. And he interviewed the residents, and he interviewed a couple of the CNAs. He interviewed Angelique. Angelique was 19 years old. She said she was scared to death to meet the residents. But when she met them, this one man was sitting in a wheelchair, and he said to her, Angelique, I am 42 years old, and I have ALS. I can only speak because of this voice box, and I can only move because of these joysticks. I am half the man I used to be. If we hire you, how will you help me feel whole again? Angelique did not know what to say. Angelique cried. Angelique was hired. And within a year of this process, they hired 40 people. Fast forward a year, 38 of them were still there. 38 out of 40. One person moved, and the other one, the DON, overrode the resident's decision because she thought they were wrong. They were right. They got it right. So including the residents in this process is really, really important. What about your receptionist? Does she have a part in hiring? She sure does. You get one chance to make a first impression. And if, if there's a job opening and she's coming for an interview and the receptionist was, oh, I didn't know you were coming. I didn't know we had, a, we, I didn't know we had an opening. What does that tell the, the person? Everyone has to be on the same page. And if you tell her to come back next Tuesday at 10 o'clock, forget it. She's already gone and got another job. There has to be a way to do this. Now, another thing to do is, um, um, <laughs> this is what one company did. When they had someone coming for an interview, the person at the desk welcomed them, and then they had a spot where the person was to go and fill out their papers. But they already had residents sitting at that spot, planted. So when the nurse aide was filling out her paperwork, the, the residents were there. Hi, how are you? What's your name? Where are you from? They did the initial screening. And they went back and they told the people, well, I don't think we, she seems pretty irritable to me. Or she was very lovely. She was very warm. She didn't get mad at me. She didn't irritate me. So screen, tour, interview, right when they came, come in. David said, if someone would come to the door looking for a job, he would immediately be called and he would go out and do an initial screening. Now, when you take them on a tour, walk quickly and see if they can keep up with you. Take the stairs, not the elevator, and see if they get out of breath. Because if, if they do, you don't want them. There's no way they can take care of 10 or 12 or however many people these poor CNAs have to take care of in a shift now. Place them next to a resident and see how they will engage with the resident. Monitor their inter interactions with people and ask the staff if they know anything about the person or what they thought about the person. Include coworkers, supervisors. Teach them how to hire. Teach them what to look for. And of course, the questions to the residents, from the residents, have to be vetted. You have to vet the questions. What do you look for? You look for maturity, compassion, sensitivity, self-esteem, the ability to communicate, and friendliness. David Farrell says that every applicant must smile five times before they will be hired. And if 
These five smiles are not crossed out during the interview. That person is not hired. We do not want moody people working in long-term care. Here are some samples of interview questions from David. Who is the nicest person you know and why? What are you most proud of? Tell me about your prior experiences in caregiving and tell me about a time that you had a conflict with your coworker and what you did about it. Tell me the names of three elders you had close relationships with in your past job. Now any nurse in this room can name at least three people that they took care of. Any one of us can. I can tell you Donald Fitzwater, Mrs. Pavlik, and Mrs. Greenberg from 1981. I took care of the, we did primary nursing, so I took care of them a lot. I knew every one of them, and I was intimately, too much intimately, involved with them. And when they died, what happens? It hurts. It hurts. But as I was saying this morning, if you are not willing to get engaged with our residents, you need to find other employment. You might work in ICU, not too long of a stay. You might work in ER, less, or in the OR where they don't even wake up. But if you're going to work in long-term care, you have got to be willing to engage with the residents. You've got to be willing. And yes, it hurts. And that is why in nursing school they told us, don't get emotionally involved. Every nurse was taught that. Don't get emotionally involved. Your residents don't want you to be standoffish. They don't want you to be standoffish. They want, they want you to be a friend. They want you to be a friend. They do that. Our data shows that. So here's an answer to a question. Ask open-ended questions. And here's an, a question. What do you like to do in your free time? Well, I'm not much of a people person. I tend to stay at home and keep to myself. You do not want that person. You do not want that person. Here are some possible resident questions. What do you do when you are stressed? What made you decide to become a CNA? If a 96-year-old resident was going toward the door to leave and told you that she was waiting for her mother to pick her up, how are you going to respond? If you were going into care for a resident who's agitated, how would you handle it? OK, so those are, you cannot let the residents just ask questions off the cuff. Because they will ask them about their religion, are they married, how many children they have, blah, blah, blah. You cannot ask that. So, I like to be new. This is a very important slide from David. Check in every morning for the first week with new employees. Every morning, check in, or whatever time they start their shift, or sometime, check, check in with them. Then, check regularly for the first month. It takes three months to feel comfortable and six months to feel competent. Do you have the supplies you need? Is there anything getting in the way of you doing your work? How are things going? Is are everything being expected? I mean, is as you expected it to be? Ask them questions like that. OK, we're going to move on here. Now, these are the top drivers of employee willingness to recommend you as a place for work. And you'll notice that care and concern, assistance with job stress, and attentiveness of management are in the top three in everything. All employees in post-acute care want to know management cares about me. They want to know that I get help with my job stress, and they want to know that management listens to me. So here are those top five for nursing homes, which we talked about. Uh, okay, now, what we're going to talk about now is my favorite part, commitment. What is commitment? Commitment is what it takes that makes a person engage or continue when difficulties arise. Or if a headhunter calls you and says, Jolie, I have a great opportunity for you in New Orleans. You are committed to Comcare and you're not about to leave. That is commitment. That is, what it, that is what we mean by commitment. So there's three types of commitment, continuance, effective, and normative. What is continuance commitment? It costs too much to leave. I'm now getting three weeks vacation. If I start that new job, I'll go back to a week. 
I've got a good 401k program at this organization. I work for the VA and I'm in a pension track. It costs too much to leave. That is called continuance commitment. And really what the data has shown is that when employees are committed for financial reasons, they are less likely to feel committed to the organization's values. The second one is effective commitment. And this starts during orientation, when they get a, an emotional bond to the organization. What is a simple thing every one of you can do with a new employee? On day one or day two, during orientation, take that new employee into the dining room and introduce them to your elders. Now, what does that say to the new employee? Number one, management cares about me. They took time out of their day, maybe five minutes, they took time out of their day to bring me in and introduce me to the residents. Number two, they know my name. They had to introduce me, so they have to know my name. You've also helped the residents, because the residents are saying, where's that new girl going to work? Where do, you, where do you think she's going to be on our shift? On our, they're gonna, now everybody knows she's going to be on Unit B working evenings. It takes such a short amount of time to begin that type of effective commitment during the first week of work. Studies have shown that a person's experience during the initial months of employment are the most crucial in, de in um, developing effective commitment. The first 90 days of onboarding are the most important. And you know very well, the turnover in the first three months is the highest. Nurse aides told me, you gotta watch those nurse aides. They say they're going out for a break. They say they're gonna go out and get a cigarette. They'll get right in that car and drive away. <laughs> Why? Because on day one, all they did was fill out paperwork. On day two, all they did was watch videos. This is the old days. And day three, because we were working short, they got a half of an assignment. No, no, no. That's not how you orient people. You don't orient them in three days and say on day four you're good to go. That's not how you do it. They're going to leave. They're going to go out to their car and drive away. So the experiences that have been found to impact effective commitment are the group's attitude toward the organization. If a person goes into orientation and then takes a break, and they go in the break room, and everyone is saying, ha, ha, I know what you're hearing, but wait till you see reality. That's not going to help. So when you hire someone, you have got to get the whole team on board. Why is that? Because, for those of you that don't know, nurses eat their young. <laughs> nurses eat their young. Today it's happening. It happened to me. I mean, I taught school for nine years before I even started nursing. So when I started nursing, I was well into my 30s. And yet I was into... I was intimidated by, by this nurse. I, wanted, it was, I was working in ICU in Cooperstown, New York, and, and the, the, somebody hadn't come in on the med surge floor, and they wanted a volunteer to go out from the uh, ICU to work on the med surge floor. So, you know, new nurse, dumb. I said, I'll go. Charge nurses, and what do you know? You came from a four-year program. You have no experience. I felt like this big. I mean, that's what we do to our own. So that is really, really important. The second thing is, is the organization de dependable and trustworthy? If you promised me that you're going to give me a tuition so that I can become an LPN, are you? Or are you going to say a year later, well, it's all over. You don't get that anymore. And then the individual's perception of his or her own importance. A lot of that comes from management. The third type of commitment is called normative commitment. It is when the employee's beliefs and the organization's beliefs go hand in hand. You see, effective commitment and normative commitment will bring about positive organizational changes. But continuance commitment may result in greater flexibility. Termination occurs when people walk either with their feet or with their hearts. You'd rather have them walk with their feet than their hearts. So how do you build this normative commitment? Let's start with the first one. What are your values? 
If you are going through a culture change in your home, what are the values you are now inculcating into your staff? What are these values? Are they different from the old values? They probably are. They're probably very different. You have to make those values known. You have to make them clear. They have to understand why those values are important. And they must be spoken from your heart. The second thing is a mission. I worked for a large nursing home company, as I told you. And every year, we got bonuses. Now, did the men in the room I was working with need bonuses? No. Did I really need a bonus? No, but I got less than them because I was a girl, right? I have just come from being with my CNA Leadership Council and hearing their stories of struggling in the state of Arkansas on $5 an hour pay, being a single mom, having a kid who's developmentally disabled. So I said to the group, management group, why don't we give up our bonuses this year and give all the CNAs a Christmas gift? How do you think that went over? What? No, I didn't get shot. No, but I didn't last long. <laughs> my values and their values, my mission and their mission, were obviously not in sync. None of us in the room needed a bonus. None of us. But the thought of giving it up for a year was beyond their thinking. And so the reality was, I was obviously in the wrong place, right? I was in the wrong job because my values did not match with theirs. My mission in life did not match with theirs. If you do not have a clear mission, you will not be a good leader. You must have a clear mission. So what is your mission? I'm not talking about the one on the corporate wall. I'm talking about your mission, mission Cher, your mission, Jolie, your mission, sister, what, your mission, Juliet. What is your mission? In religious life, we are required to rewrite, to write our own mission statement. I was 19. I was in the novitiate. We are totally cloistered during that 366 days of canonical year. You don't talk to anybody outside the other novices. Nobody, and I mean nobody. We talked one hour in the evening and 15 minutes at lunch. That was it. I did that. <laughs> and we did two other things. We made our habit, we learned how to sew. We made our habit, which we wore on uh, the day we made our first vows, that was our wedding dress. And we wrote our mission statement and if you've ever read Aging with Grace, you will see that they studied the biographies that we wrote at the glorious age of 19. My mission statement was, and I have it still on a holy card, I will pass this way but once. If there is any good I can do my fellow man, let me not defer nor neglect it, for I will not pass this way again. Have I lived that all my life? Uh-uh. Have I tried? Yes. Do I keep trying? Yes. Now you have to come up with your mission statement. What is your mission statement? If you share your mission statement with your staff, that is the most powerful thing you can do to build their commitment to you and to the organization. If the mission statements go opposite directions, like mine did at this company, it's time to leave. It's time to get off the bus before you were told to get off. Here's a mission statement that, if you don't have one, you might like. To laugh often and much. To win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children. To earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends. To appreciate beauty, to find the best in others. To leave the world a little better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition. To know that even one life has breathed easier because you have lived is to have succeeded. Now look around this room and look around this convention hall. 
Ask yourself how many years you've worked in long-term care and multiply that by 365. Every one of those days, not one person slept better, many people slept better. Many residents slept better because of you. Many families slept better because of you. Many employees slept better because of you. Where in the United States can we find more successful people than at this meeting? We can't. You're it, ladies and gentlemen. You are the most successful people. And if you haven't formulated your mission statement, go home and do it. Go home and do it. Because people stay in organizations because they want to, because they need to, or because they ought to. So it's like bacon and eggs. The hen is engaged, but the pig is committed. <laughs> so you have to share your vision. Share, just give me a few more minutes. There are those who look at things the way they are and ask why. And there are those of us that dream of things that never were and ask why not. Why can't our nursing homes be a place where elders want to live, where elders can grow? It can be a vision. It can be a reality. But you cannot just have a fluffy dream. You have to have a plan. A dream and a vision without a plan is no good. You have to have a plan of how you are moving forward. You need to create a structure for the vision you have. You see, Martin Luther King had a dream, and he dreamed that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of this creed, that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, whether they are black or white or Muslim, whether they live in a nursing home or assisted living or in home care. They are all created equal. And that was what his dream was, and that is what he died for. And that was a pretty big thing in 1963 when I was in the novitiate writing my mission statement. That's how time has gone. Leaders are doers, not dreamers. You can get people to be compliant, but you can't get them to be committed. You can help them, you can egg them, but you cannot say, you will be committed. You can't do that. So. That is what we, there's a lot more in your handout. And I, I, I do, just if you don't mind, I want to go to the very end because I have kind of a cute thing I want to show you as a closing statement. But there's a lot more in this presentation which you can join. This is all about your leadership style, those slides. You can figure that out yourself. And then I just want, there's a little thing on communication there. These are all the data from our various surveys that you can look at and see. And here I want to introduce you to this sweet, dear woman. The local news station was interviewing this 80-year-old lady because she had just gotten married for the fourth time. The interviewer asked her questions about her life and what it felt like being married again at the age of 80. And then about her new husband's occupation, who was a funeral director. She answered, interesting, the newsman thought. He then asked her, if she wouldn't mind telling him a little more about her first three husbands and what they did for a living. She paused for a few moments, needing a few, few, time, few minutes to recollect. After a short time, a smile came to her face, and she answered proudly, explaining she had first married a banker when she was in her 20s, then a circus ringmaster when she was in her 40s, and a preacher when she was in her 60s, and now in her 80s, she's married to a funeral director. The interviewer looked at her quite astonished and asked why she had married four men with such diverse careers. And she said, I married one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. Thank you so much. <laughs>